Hey everyone, this is Lauren. Hope you're all staying at home and safe in these very wild times. Remember to wash your hands frequently and make sure that you take care of yourselves and the people around you. Anyway, today we are going to be covering the topic of narrative design in video games. So, first of all, we are going to address the overarching question of what narrative design actually is. On the surface level, it may seem like the term narrative design refers to the plot of your game. In other words, the script written for NPC dialogue, narration, and so on and so forth. However, good narrative design in practice is actually something that ties together big picture design elements, like story, level design, quest elements, and character development, to create a game that feels cohesive to the player. Having a strong story does not necessarily make a strong video game. However, a strong story in conjunction with strong narrative design provides the player with a more engaging and enriching narrative experience, thus creating an overall more effective game. There are multiple techniques that designers can use to implement strong narrative design. You may remember a few of these from Wayland's level design lecture, which he gave earlier in the semester. One option is environmental storytelling. For instance, in the game Journey, the story is not laid out explicitly through narration, but rather through the setting that the player must interact with while working their way through the game. On the other hand, a game like Minecraft may use a technique like emergent narrative, wherein the player creates their own personal narrative via their execution of the mechanics implemented within the game. Other games use more apparent in-game storytelling techniques, like in Bastion, which has constant narration as you progress through the game, or like in Skyrim, where you can access plot and world-building details through in-game journals and documents. All of these techniques are ways to create an effective narrative within your game, but for the purposes of this lecture, we are going to focus in more on that last bullet point. Namely, the idea of telling a predetermined story that is interwoven throughout your gameplay. We're going to cover five specific storytelling el design elements that may be useful in creating a cohesive story for your game. However, before we get started, it's important to note that you probably can't do all of these things at once. Once again, these are guidelines rather than a checklist. If you don't include all of these elements, no one's going to penalize you. In fact, many games developed by large name studios don't even meet all of these criteria. Use these as tools rather than rules to make a game that you personally pre feel proud of. So, design element number one, focusing on telling a specific story within your game. I know this may seem intuitive, but if your goal is to tell a story, then telling that specific story should be the main goal of your game. If you're focusing more on non-core mechanics or level design, that's completely fine, but just keep in mind that a story placed within your game may not work as effectively for the player if it isn't the main focus of your game. Design element two, proportioning the amount of time spent on gameplay. If you're planning on creating a game with a strong narrative, try to strike a reasonable balance between story and gameplay. Including things like cutscenes or in-game documents is fine, but if they're the majority of the experience, then you lose the unique nature of the medium that you're creating in. Video games are meant to be interactive, so your game should be mostly gameplay rather than mostly cutscenes. Element three, making sure that your interactions fit within the narrative. Each interaction that the player has with the story or with NPCs within the story should serve a purpose and move your narrative forward. It should also help the player understand their role in the world and the rules of the world that you've created. And the interaction should be coherent with the rest of the story. Try to avoid padding scenes or interactions with unnecessary fodder. All scenes and interactions should update the player's mental model of the game, as you might remember from the Game Loops lecture. The mental model is the player's knowledge of the rules of the world that you've created and the rules governing gameplay. If you have a lot of meaningless interactions that don't improve the player's understanding of the characters or the world, they will become disinterested very quickly. Element 4. Avoiding excessive repetition. Aside from the classic repetitive is boring reasoning, patterns within gameplay can lead to recognition and the subsequent need for optimization from the player, which can detract from the narrative if the player gets too caught up in mechanically optimizing how they play the game. However, rather than changing the mechanics of the game so that the player is never familiar enough with them to recognize and optimize them, iterating off of a strong core mechanic will help you avoid repetition while not frustrating the player and forcing them to learn entirely new concepts from scratch. And last but not least, Element five, avoiding major progression blocks. Creating a challenging game is fine, but if the goal is to tell a story, then throwing the player at a puzzle that takes days to complete can be counterproductive to that goal. 
Make the challenges that your player faces reasonable if you want to focus on the story that you tell. All right, so we are going to dive into each of these design elements in more detail, starting with element one. In order to achieve effective storytelling, the game should be designed with a specific story in mind. For example, the design of the game Bejeweled, pictured uh, in the top row to the left, obviously doesn't yield itself to a story. Trying to incorporate one would feel awkward and out of place. However, a game like Undertale was clearly created with the intent of telling a story that the creator wanted to convey through an interactive medium, and so it works very effectively. Prioritizing storytelling during gameplay design also helps avoid shoehorning in bland, excessively abstract stories that may make the player lose interest in your narrative. Moving on to element two, the idea of balancing time spent on gameplay and time spent on during cutscenes. This is meant to promote immersion within your game. If you force the player to experience long periods of just cutscenes and no gameplay, it can very quickly take them out of the world that you've created. This is a complaint that players have had with the game Heavy Rain, to some people, it felt more like watching a movie than playing a video game. But this criticism is not as prevalent for a game like The Last of Us, which has a fairly strong balance of cutscenes with gameplay, and thus allows players to more fully immerse themselves in the environment and rules of the game. The medium of video games and interactive storytelling is often used to give the player a presence within the world of the game, so because of this, you'll sometimes hear that in game design, the player's choice is the highest priority. However, this is not necessarily a requirement for immersion. A compelling narrative and a strong balance between gameplay and lore will help allow this to happen without any arbitrary standards for interactivity. Element three, making sure that interactions, whether they're interactions with specific NPCs, the rules of the game, the world of the game, or anything else of that nature, making sure that they all fit cohesively within the narrative. This is another important facet of immersion. Connecting the actions that players take to important narrative events gives the player a better idea of their role in the story at large. From an immersion standpoint, it piques their interest and forces them into an active role, rather than just observing events that unfold. This isn't just limited to interactions with NPCs or in-game texts like journals, letters, either. Your gameplay as a whole should be designed to place the player in an active role and provide them with a place within the world of your game. Essentially, playing your game should not be a side activity while the player waits for another cutscene or lore drop. It all comes back to promoting immersion within your game. Which leads us into our next element, avoiding excessive repetition. We've already discussed the role that repetition can have in players prioritizing optimization over experiencing a story, as well as the fact that doing something too many times in a row can get boring very easily. But to reiterate, this doesn't mean that you need to constantly change or completely transform the mechanics of your game to keep the player engaged. That would be a lot of work for you, on top of potentially becoming frustrating to the player as they have to relearn a constantly changing rule set. It's better to vary a solid core mechanic instead, for instance, in the game Braid, pictured at the top there. Braid has a core mechanic of time manipulation, but each different world within the game introduces a new and interesting variation on this mechanic that keeps the player engaged. And so now we come to our last design element, avoiding major progression blocks. We've all, we've all played a game where there was one task or enemy that was so punishingly difficult, we had to pause the game and go consult a walkthrough for it. And obviously this can detract from the player's immersion into your story. Some common examples of major progression blocks come in the form of maze environments, overly complex puzzles, or tasks that demand a mastery of the game that some players may just not be able to achieve. This isn't to say that these types of puzzles or difficult or challenging puzzles in general are off limits. For example, the game Limbo, pictured at the bottom, is designed to be somewhat difficult, often killing off the player in an array of pretty gruesome ways. However, the game is also designed to allow for easy progression. The traps and enemies are easy to grasp, and the player is returned to checkpoints along their gameplay route rather than being shunted all the way back to the beginning. So even though Limbo is difficult, it doesn't force the player to stall to the point of frustration, and thus the player is able to be more immersed within the narrative of the game. Okay, so now that we've covered a few elements for effective storytelling in greater detail, I am going to hand it off to Waylon, who will discuss methods of implementing narrative design into your game. Thanks for the handoff, Lauren. My section of this lecture is going to dive into some implementation details on how to have better narrative design in your games. So, in this section, I'll be talking about the four-layered approach to narrative design and storytelling, 
This is a method that some industry professionals use when creating narratively driven games. In this method, we'll be breaking up your design process into the four steps shown on screen. It's important to note that this can be done for any type of game you want, as long as you have some sort of story. The general ideas we're going to hit on is that you can break down a game into its various different scenes. Each scene can be anything. For example, we could have a combat encounter, we could have a dialogue encounter with an NPC, or simply just a puzzle room. When creating a game from a narrative point of view, oftentimes you'll be putting less emphasis on the big gameplay loop and focusing in more on having the gameplay fit the scenes that you're trying to set up. So let's start with building the gameplay, which can be further subdivided four times. Your narrative beats must be kept in mind when you're designing your gameplay. If it doesn't fit, you're going to reduce the overall feel of your game. So first things first, we have cohesion. Your gameplay must fit with the world, the tone, and your characters. What the player must accomplish must make sense narratively and not just be some random series of actions. Let's say you're in a zombie survival game and, you know, chances are you're going to want to shoot zombies and not get bitten. You wouldn't expect to hop into a zombie game and then suddenly get presented with a Candy Crush-esque Match 3 style gameplay system. Second, we have streamlining. Um, what this means is that you want to avoid convoluted and obscure gameplay that has too many steps. We want to minimize the chance that a player gets stuck and even if they do, we want to ensure that they don't remain stuck. This allows a player to keep mental track of the narrative and helps the player think ahead. If some puzzle requires dozens of steps, you'd very quickly lose track of the narrative as you focused in on the puzzle elements. Third is to give players a sense of accomplishment. In a narratively focused game, it's a little bit more difficult to include accomplishment. Normally we'd have accomplishment built into the actual core gameplay loop, like how Mario has a literal end flag for you to slide down after a bunch of platforming. Making the player feel like they have agency is a great way to spark this sense of accomplishment though. Some way to do this include solving puzzles, coming up with creative solutions, making difficult story choices, navigating the map, or finding story clues in the plot itself. Lastly, we have action confirmation. The basic of this is that players must understand what they are doing and why they are doing it. Mechanically, you might say, I jump over a hole to not fall down into it or I shoot a bad guy so that my player doesn't get shot back. Narratively, the player must understand their actions. They might be trying to push a button to activate a machine that stops the big bad evil guy. But if the player stumbles upon this button by accident and you know they have no idea what it does, then the narrative is lost in the gameplay. So if you see the picture right here, I have an example of what basic layer one gameplay might look like. So let's say we've got a medieval detective game. In my world, I have a locked door and a hidden key. In terms of coherency, having this door in our medieval type detective game makes total sense. It's got a lock, as I would expect in a detective game, and it's wooden and not some sort of, you know, super futuristic sliding space door. Um, the room has hiding spots, but is relatively small so that the player won't get stuck. This will help streamline the game itself so the player doesn't spend, you know, hours and hours just like f stumbling around, not being able to find the key. In terms of accomplishment, you know, maybe this door is hiding a great treasure relevant to the character's story. Whatever it is, behind it can be something important to the narrative. Lastly, we have action confirmation. Set up properly through small hints, it should be pretty obvious that you need a hidden key to open up this door. Okay, next let's tackle the narrative goal. In a lot of games, the normal reason for finishing a gameplay segment is literally to just progress the game. Sure, you might want to kill the evil wizard at the end of the game, but that's like 40 hours into the game, you don't have to worry about it right now. Because of this, when encountering any sort of obstacle, players will just think, oh I just need to get this out of the way to continue on with the story which is bad because it disconnects the narrative from the actual gameplay. The easiest way to fix this is with short-term, narratively driven goals. You want the player engaged in the gameplay that is motivated by the narrative goal. It's about doing something because of the story, not doing something to get the story moving again.
Here I have three examples of short-term narrative goals, but keep in mind these are just examples. The most obvious and simple one is mystery. You know, there's something unknown that you want to find out, whether it's a shooter, a JRPG, a puzzle game, you can use the mystery to drive the story along. Next is to use uncomfortable environments. If you want your players to move towards a certain direction, you can create a dark and scary environment that makes the player want to leave, or you can have like a really depressing funeral reception that the player, you know, doesn't want to stay around in. Keep in mind though that you want a story reason for this discomfort, else you risk the previously mentioned disconnect between game and narrative. Lastly, we have conflict. Now this can range from a combat conflict to a social conflict to even a character conflict. The player will be guided towards solving this conflict one way or another, and it's an easy way to create narrative reasons for doing any sort of action. Okay, now we've got layer 3, narrative backgrounds. With the addition of narrative goals, our scenes are now becoming a lot more narratively driven. However, the actions the player is taking are still kind of gameplay focused. You know, searching for a key in an environment is still mechanical and there isn't a proper sense of storytelling. After adding the narrative goal, we've moved from doing X thing to get the story going to let's do this thing because of the story. Now, in this section, we want to move into do this thing to make the story appear. To best accomplish this, we want gameplay and narrative beats to coincide and to have player actions cause the story to emerge instead of them just being a means to an end. Story fragments and emotional assets are just a few ways to accomplish this goal. The most basic form of a story fragment is an audio log or a diary entry. While these are good in moderation, it's important to not interrupt the gameplay. Clues should be found as the player naturally progresses and shouldn't feel like a separate, optional activity. If items or set pieces have strong emotional value to characters in the game, then the player is much less likely to see these things as an abstract tool meant just for gameplay. There's a huge difference between, hey, I found a notebook that has some hints in it, to, oh, I found my dead brother's notebook with hints about his murder. Lastly, we've got mental modeling. The goal here is to really tap into the way the player imagines and thinks about the game. The most crucial note is that players will be coming up with their own mental models of the game, a type of mental representation of what is shown on the screen. This is the same sort of thought process that goes on when you read a book or watch a film. A big goal of helping the players to create this mental model is to hide your gameplay systems. Having your game's guts exposed can be extremely immersion shattering. Have what's shown to the player line up with knowledge and intuition of the real world. I shouldn't have to ram my character into different parts of a wall in order to find exactly where your door collider is in order to leave a room. Small things like this easily form a disconnect between your mental mindscape and what's shown on screen. My last point is going to be that mental modeling is a valid form of gameplay. Just showing your character and environment as they travel, letting them imagine off of the small clues in the world is also gameplay. You don't necessarily need a combat encounter to keep things going, use it at your own discretion. Now I'll quickly go through some easy high level mental models. Once again, keep in mind these are just three basic examples to show you what's possible, and there are infinitely more out there to fit your game's needs. First we've got danger. Create something that's not a common occurrence that lurks and constitutes a threat to your player. The player can then create their own interpretation for what's going on based off of the few clues you show them. Think of any horror game you want. Oftentimes, you're not shown what threat, you know, usually a monster or a creature, until much later on, but you're privy to the actions that the threat is carrying out. Next, you have high-level mysteries. You know, maybe your player needs to solve a crime or complete a puzzle. Whenever the player enters a new environment, they'll start looking for, you know, and piecing together clues without you nudging them. Think of any murder mystery. The moment you enter a new scene, you're already trying to piece together clues from the art, from the environment, from whoever's in the actual environment right now. Lastly, we have NPC interactions. 
giving the player NPCs with meaningful interactions will let them create their own mental models as they talk to and interact with their AI-driven buddies. Look at The Last of Us. I mean, yeah, you're really only interacting with a small handful of NPCs, but they are amazingly well-written and help contribute to the immersion you feel in the actual world. Okay, in summary, keep the elements of good storytelling in mind when constructing your narrative. Focus on telling a specific story, balancing the amount of time spent in gameplay versus in cutscenes, making sure your gameplay and story interactions fit within the narrative, and avoiding excessive repetition and major progression blocks that take the player out of the story. When designing a story-based game, you should be constantly thinking about the story. It's easy to get happy with your well-designed gameplay loop, but with our four-layer method, story becomes an essential part of the gameplay, and your game should reflect that. You can also use what you've learned today both proactively and retroactively. If you've already got some ideas down, you can use this to tell if your gameplay segments are just filler or if they're lacking in some sort of area. Now, just a warning, this methodology requires a lot of time and a lot of planning. Tying your story and gameplay together will make edits and changes really, really time consuming and expensive. If you change one part of your story, you're going to have to, you know, have the gameplay changed as well to reflect that. Likewise, changing your gameplay means you're going to have to go back and storyboard a reason behind, you know, the change that you made. Okay, that about wraps up my lecture. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to fill out the quiz which will be linked in the description box below.